through your donations that we're able to keep this building and make it available to this kind of thing. So thank you for doing that. And let's welcome Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, for the invitation. Thank all of you for being interested in our, our store. Um, I've asked several people, what should I talk about? Because uh, <clears throat> The family business spans 132 years. How do you crowd this into you know, a few minutes? So the advice that I received from Bud Golter was let the audience tell you what they want to hear about. Uh, go through a few things in, in a big hurry, but uh, turn it over to the audience. So we've handed out to you copies of uh, a tie book that came from our store. It was originally published in 1899. Uh, my father was given the original of this, and he had it reprinted. And what you have is a reprint, and if anybody needs more, I have plenty. Uh, but he had this done for the centennial of our store, which was in 1985. We had uh, Doug Allen do some research on the history of the store, and Doug has uh, prepared most of the manuscript for the book. And uh, like so many other pieces of history, there are little pieces and parts that don't make sense. If you uh, take a look about three pages back, uh, four pages back, uh, <coughs> this page, the one on the left, it says the firm of Moorhead & Company was uh, established in 1885. And this was printed by J. A. Moorhead, founder. <coughs> Doug Allen came across a piece of uh, a document between Loomis and Moorhead, dated January of 1886, which was their partnership agreement. And Loomis was loaning money to Moorhead. Moorhead was going to establish his business and repay. Loomis on a specific schedule, and Loomis was going to haul all of the freight via his stage line coming up the beach. So I guess you'd call that, uh, in today's parlance, it's uh, alternative facts. Was it 1885 or 1886? We don't know. So uh, we, we, we've stuck with Moorhead's 1885 number. Um, that little tidbit, of course, has proven to be valuable for me personally over the years because uh, dealing with as many state agencies as I do, conflict is, is common and oftentimes when things aren't going well, I can change the tone of the conversation by pointing out to the state person that we were here first. <laughs> Washington became a state in 1889, we were here in 1885, don't we have some aboriginal rights? <laughs> it never changes the outcome, but it always changes the tone. <laughs> so, anyway, um, Moorhead had a rather successful business. Um, his first store was in Oysterville, then he moved to Nakata. Um, then he built a store in Ocean Park. The big fire in Nakata took out the, uh, the Nakata store. That was rebuilt and is uh, currently serving as uh, the post office and Bailey's. Um, burned the Ocean Park store, I think it was 1925. Rather than rebuild, they moved a huge two-story structure from the next block. This structure had belonged to the uh, I believe the name is the Woodworkers of America, also known as the Wobblies, a, a communist organization. But they moved this building across the railroad tracks west a full block. And if you look at the uh, photo of the last run of the Clamsick Channel Railroad, you see the big building there. And, and just imagine what it took to move that building back in that era. 
So anyway, they burned that store in 1937. <laughs> uh, the joke was that uh, Moorhead needed three stores to keep two up and standing. <laughs> um, Charles Fitzpatrick, the, the well-known photographer, took a lot of photos. He has photos, or took a lot of photos of the, uh, the burning of the second store. And uh, that was in 1937. Fitzpatrick went on to become uh, very active in fire suppression and he was part of the uh, reason the state legislature in 1939 authorized the formation of fire protection districts and Pacific County Fire Protection District number one was the first one in Pacific County and it was established in 1940. So uh, I guess fire has always been part of it part of our pedigree. Uh, so when they rebuilt, they built a smaller store on the same location. Uh, the second story of the, uh, the old building uh, has been used for uh, community gatherings. So they had plays and they had all sorts of events upstairs. So it wasn't really being used for store purposes. And so they downsized a little bit. And at that point in time, Ocean Park had pretty much fallen in the hard times. The railroad was gone, and the right-of-way was sold, and there was no road connecting Ocean Park and Long Beach. So uh, the, uh, the connection really became uh, with Raymond and South Bend because the, uh, the ship traffic the, was still active on the bay. So uh, anyway, Ocean Park was seeing a, a revitalization when my parents came along. Um, the store had just had its best uh, year in history. Sid's Market had burned in 1968, and the M&M Market, which sat where the Bank of the Pacific uh, is now and later became Okies, um, it had closed. So they were the only game in town, and, and the store was doing quite well. My parents bought the, uh, the business, with the exception of the inventory, they, for the land, building, fixtures, equipment, and goodwill, they paid $25,000 <laughs> for all of my time. And uh, they had to scrape the money together from uh, friends and relatives, and uh, my father uh, used uh, life insurance cash value, and uh, they scraped the money to, together. And, bought the store. And Ocean Park started to blossom. Uh, Surfside Estates was still quite fresh. People were discovering the north end of the peninsula because you could buy a building lot for seven, eight hundred dollars. And you could put in a septic system for five hundred dollars. Um, and, and water was free. You just uh, tell the guy and put in a well. And uh, the PD didn't have any uh, charges to uh, connect to the to their service. They, they would give you the line extensions. So uh, the building, when my parents acquired it, uh, had a cold water tap that came from next door at the gas station. It did not have hot water. It did not have a toilet. Uh, certainly no septic system. And uh, the heat was an oil stove and uh, minimal lighting in the place. So they took to uh, making a bunch of improvements, starting with the electric service, well, actually starting with the bathroom. Uh, electrical upgrades. They knocked out the partition that was between the original um, sales floor, and half of the building was back room. So they knocked out the partition, made the whole thing sales floor. And that was just the first of many, many, many small steps um, what we now call the point of sale system was two hand crank adding machines, <laughs> and the cat, all of the uh, all of the products had prices written on them with grease pencil. <laughs> so uh, price changes weren't really very easy at the time, um, and that was before the sticker guns. But the cashier would bring up hand tally all of these things on a, a hand crank adding machine. 
take the slip, get the customer's money, and go over and we had an electric cash register that was common to the two cashiers. And uh, the vast majority of the sales were on charge account books. And uh, that was kind of an unwieldy mess as well. But uh, we survived. Uh, the refrigeration at the time amounted to a little two-door cooler. We didn't have beer and wine. The former owner uh, was a recovering alcoholic, and so he didn't have an alcohol license. Um, eggs were, uh, were merchandised in the front window. No refrigeration. Uh, so we had milk and a little bit of produce and some packaged lunch meats in this, uh, in this small cooler. And then we had a service meat counter. Uh, we were buying meat from a, a grocer in Long Beach, and uh, the bread delivery truck the driver would, would haul it to us. So we were phoning in both meat orders every day, and it uh, shows up. Hamburger was bulk. Uh, we had a paddle and a scale and a paper, and, and just slop it out. And uh, that, that was the way it was done. So uh, the expansions really got underway around 1972. We added the, uh, the room that is to the east side of the wood floor area where we have all those old glass showcases. And then a few years later, we added a corresponding match uh, piece to the west, which now has all of our housewares and upstairs it has the office. Um, one of the things that we've done over the years is buy liquidations. And the first one of any significance, uh, my father bought about a truckload of closeout paint and he had to rent the building uh, across the street where uh, the Dunes restaurant used to sit. It was the original Ocean Park Post Office and uh, Tronson, or not Tronson, but uh, Billy Pearson's grocery store later operated by Ed Chellis. And we had that whole place filled with paint. And I thought my father was a little bit nuts there, but uh, yeah. because it was hard selling that paint. The next thing he did was he um, bought the contents of what was then called Clark Plumbing and Heating. It had been Harold Sprague's uh, plumbing shop in what is now the Eagles building. And that whole place was just absolutely full of pipe fittings and ancient plumbing stuff and uh, tons and tons and tons of stuff. Anyway, we were under the gun to get out of there because the Eagles had purchased the property that belonged to Lee Weicker. And uh, we were under the gun to get out of that. But those were just the first two in a whole string of liquidation sales where we found our Selves with the ability to get into peculiar lines of merchandise by getting all of the peripheral, uh, expensive, <coughs> odd pieces at a bargain based price, and then we could fill in the common ones. And uh, that's certainly how it worked with plumbing fittings. You know, imagine going to a shoe store that's had liquidation. All the sizes uh, 6 through 11 are gone, but now you can buy the 14 to 18 size for pennies on the dollar. If, if it's a current model, you can, uh, you can afford to be in that line, and now you can even be a dominant player because you have such a comprehensive assortment. Um, in 1976, there was a restaurant that sat where our parking lot is now. Uh, it had originated as uh, the Munsell Cottage, and it was a summer home, and then they'd added a restaurant and then a bar onto it, and uh, it caught fire uh, in many locations. <laughs> it, it caught fire. It nearly burned our store. Um, and then I learned later from the old time I heard Herb McClintock that when our store had burned in 1937 and it took out the meat market between the store and the uh, Munsell Cottage, that the Munsell Cottage almost went to the ground. And sure enough, when we were tearing it down, the whole east wall of the Munsell house 
had two layers of shingles and the one underneath was scorched. So my father bought the, uh, the Munsell property, which included everything from Bay Avenue um, clear back to 260th on the west portion of, of the block. But uh, there are a lot of trials and tribulations because there have been so many owners and interests in that that the title report had three pages of exceptions. <laughs> and uh, there were lots of creditors who wanted to be made whole. And uh, anyway, I don't know how we ever navigated all that, but uh, he did. Uh, <coughs> A year or two later, we bought what had been uh, the Ocean Park, Richfield, and then Arco Station. It was the east half of the block where the store is now, where our hardware department is. And um, a lot of our timing was just simply blind luck. Um, Lila Weiger might know a piece of this story. Um, her father-in-law sold it. And this was the late 1970s. It was right after the oil embargo. We had all the wage and price controls that you folks may remember. One of the federal rules was that no retailer of gasoline can make any more than 13 cents a gallon. And everybody scratched their head. Well, the unintended consequence was that every gasoline retailer in America moved his margin up from three or four cents a gallon to 13 cents a gallon. <laughs> so, Rather than paying off that uh, that note in 15 years, we did it in 18 months, <laughs> just because there was a windfall profit, um, thanks to the federal government. So, uh, 1978 or so, we uh, we made the first major addition to the south of the original structure, and we brought the entryway around from Bay Avenue and that face north and we brought it over to the face west. And uh, shortly thereafter we put in our self-service gas uh, station. Um, that one was very expensive, $40,000 to do the whole shoot and match and today that's about the cost of a permit. Oh. Um, and, well, <laughs> it, it's also about the price of a, a single dispenser. But uh, it, anyway, it, it was one of those where uh, county fire marshal came out and uh, my father said, we want to dig a hole and put some fuel tanks in. And he says, okay, why not? <laughs> so, that, that was what it took to get a building permit. And I remember my father talking to uh, with some of the old time builders. Uh, one time it was with Bud Matthews and uh, Ross Glasson, our building inspector, and uh, the means of obtaining a building permit in those days was uh, you get the builder, you get the property owner, you get the building inspector, and the three of you look around and look up in the sky and wave your arms around a little bit, and uh, you, know, you write a check for a few dollars, and you've got a building permit. It hasn't always worked out that way. <laughs> so. Uh, 1980, we added fuel pumps. 81, we added it to the south of the building again. Um, 82, we uh, were trying for another building permit to add our hardware department. We wound up buying uh, property to the west of high, uh, the west of uh, Vernon or Pacific or uh, Highway 103, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, bought half. Uh, a portion of that uh, to try to satisfy the county's requirements for off-street parking requirements. And uh, one thing led to another, but uh, anyway, the uh, Superior Court judge sided with us when we finally got it all settled. And uh, so then we added our hardware department. We took out the old gas station, and behind it was um, a shoe shop but that shoe shop had originally been, been the first arts tavern, later called Doc's Tavern. And uh, as many of you may know, uh, that tavern opened the day Prohibition ended. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's when they got their license. Um, other milestones, more recently, 1998, we stumbled into 
sales on the internet. Um, it happened to correspond with um, the timing when I got involved with the, uh, the kerosene lamp manufacturer named Aladdin. And it corresponded with the Y2K phenomenon. As many of you recall, everybody was afraid the power grid was going to fail. So I started buying Aladdin lamps anywhere I could get them. And I had a number of vendors who had them, and I could buy them direct. At one point, we had more than 1,000 lamps in inventory. We were not advertising, and we refused to sell more than two to a single address. We could have sold every lamp a hundred times over during that time period. Um, this launched our internet business. Um, again, a piece of blind luck. So the internet led us to the print catalog, and so now we have to, all three legs of this stool that everybody is talking about. If you have physical presence, if you have an internet presence, and if you have a print uh, vehicle, this brings it all together. That's how you're going to optimize it. And uh, fortunately, we, we were able to do that, largely because one of the other people who invested in this Latin kerosene manufacturing, uh, kerosene lamp manufacturing company was a guy named Jay Lehman, who ran a hardware store in the central part of Ohio, in a town that makes Ocean Park look big. <laughs> and when I first met Jay, he told me that uh, he was printing 500,000 catalogs twice a year for his store. Mm -hmm. and so he, he builds himself as your non-electric superstore. And it's very true. Um, it, you, during the height of all this, he told me that uh, Somebody asked him, why don't you put in a second telephone line? Little did they know that during that point in time, the Y2K rush was such a big thing, especially for, for somebody like him, because he was being treated to every single national news organization. He was it. He was the guy who had everything, and they just picked up on it. So Jay Lehman had just purchased a house and put in another 12 telephone lines for being staffed 24 hours a day to take orders. He told me at one point he had 10,000 orders in-house that he could not fulfill. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, anybody in, the, anybody in our business sees this as lost opportunity. So, blind luck. There we go. And uh, he helped me uh, get into the catalog business. And that has kind of taken off and uh, become a life of its own. Of its own. Um, we added a second fuel island in 1999, and uh, we're looking at uh, refurbishing again because, uh, as I say, our, our tanks were installed in 1980. Uh, so we're, we're in the market. Um, we decided to go into the clam equipment business in 2002. We could not buy a, a good enough quality assortment or get it at the price we needed to uh, satisfy our own needs. And so uh, we decided that we'd go into it. And the reason that market was waiting for us is what you see today. The uh, clam seasons are so fickle that nobody wants to invest in it. Well, we were going to be our own best customer, and we knew it, but uh, we decided to invest in the tooling and the inventory and get into it on a, a manufacturing level um, with the full knowledge and understanding that this is an investment you don't want to make if you don't have the cash up front. We were delighted that we took that uh, that perspective because we put up a building, we made the investment, and uh, we went a year without clam digging <laughs> <laughs> immediately thereafter. So, so that, that worked out. Um, we've had to modernize in recent years. In 2006, we went to scan. We were one of the, the last holdouts in the grocery business to not scan. 
uh, when we put in that system, the equipment vendor scoffed at us when we said, we need a system that has the capability of over 200,000 items. And uh, they, they thought we were nuts. Uh, they've since told us we are the first account we've ever had, and this is the manufacturer of the equipment, we're the first account that has ever needed to add on to their base model. <laughs> um, so we've done a couple other things. Uh, one rep that we actually ran into was a couple years ago. Um, sat down with Guy Glenn. Uh, many of you may know that uh, Guy is on the Ocean Spray Board. And he was just doing a little review and he said, you know, you guys really need to trademark your name. He said, Ocean Spray's trademark by itself is worth more than all of its physical assets. You guys have something here, you know, you've got to trademark this. So, sure enough, chase down one of those big city lawyers who can, uh, who has this as a specialty, and of course, bills you at $500 an hour. <laughs> Preliminary search, oh yeah, green light, here we go. Well, we had an objection from Kellogg's because Jack's is too close to Apple Jack's, and we were private labeling surprise. And our choice at that point was to fight forward, or else we couldn't just withdraw it at that point. If, if we were to withdraw, we'd have to change our name and quit using the Jack's name. So we got through it. But, uh, Lots of peculiar twists and turns. Our, our grocery supplier helped out a whole bunch. They, uh, we found some old Applejack slogans that said uh, things to the effect, uh, stand up to bullies. <laughs> and uh, they, they switched from uh, in-house counsel to outside counsel. And so this lawyer from uh, Michigan calls our attorney in Seattle and uh, they're having a conversation, and uh, lo and behold, she allowed us how her husband had purchased her Christmas gift from us oh. <laughs> online. And uh, of course, he used that as an argument. Any confusion with Kellogg's? You know? So we, we finally got it settled, but uh, we cannot put our name on cereal or granola. <laughs> so we're, we're good with that. Um, anyway, that, that's about the extent of what I've uh, prepared for wow. the, the rundown. I'm sure that uh, people have their own experiences and uh, history. So, one person I, I spoke to, Bob Brake, he said, You've got to talk about Swede. <laughs> well, Edmund Swede Johnson um, was a man we knew when we lived in Longview back in the uh, 1960s, he worked in a little store called Holtz, and it was a general merchandise store, and it was the only one that was open on Sundays, which is when my father was always recruiting me and my brothers to do the home improvement projects. Mm -hmm. And so we knew we knew Swede, and uh, Swede was quite a character. Well, Swede moved to the beach, and uh, of course he was coming into the store, and there there's more than one version of his uh, application for employment. My father's version is, Swede uh, said to him, I think I'll come to work for this joint. <laughs> and father's response was, oh, when would you start? <laughs> and Swede said, Monday. Mm -hmm. well, Swede came to work for us. <laughs> uh, he retired when he turned 80. His, his wife just put pressure on him and said, you know, Edmund, you're, you're too old for this. You're 80. Quit. Well, he retired. We gave him the gold watch. A couple months later, Betty says to Swede, you're miserable, aren't you? Yeah. Go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he came back to work. Then she got ill later, and he retired a second time after she passed. He came back again and uh, worked for us right up to uh, his final days. Uh, but Bob Brake's uh, story is that his very first visit to our store, um, he came in and speak in customary style. 
to you know, total, stranger, total stranger here. You know, how can I swindle you today? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, that made an impression on Bob. And, and so, like so many other people, they're just buttons for, buttons for punishment. They would come in to see how sweet could insult them. <laughs> you know, total strangers. Uh, he, he would uh, he, he would ask people. Uh, did you come in to buy something, or just come in to get warm? <laughs> um, he was very good at defusing a lot of situations. Uh, uh, oftentimes, you'd see husband and wife uh, having some sort of conflict over paint color, or, or imagine that, um, or, or, or some choice. And uh, Swede would forever look at the woman and just say, Please be kind to your father. And I'll just get home. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did see a lady get the best of Swede one day, um, and you can always tell when somebody pulled one on him. But uh, she came in. And, you know, can I help you, lady? Response was, "Oh, I'm looking for a husband," and uh, and, and he, he'd wander around. Now. You got those two columns over there. <laughs> you know, or two, we don't have much of a selection today. <laughs> but uh, this one woman said, she took about two steps and she stopped and she turned her up. And she said to him, No, I need to retrieve the one I brought in, otherwise, you'd charge me with littering. <laughs> And I remember, uh, and Claire Sweet would step in it. Gail can probably tell a lot of stories about Sweet. Um, one time, uh, Sweet grew up in the Vancouver area, had a very colorful history. He only, he said he was only in jail one time, and that was for stealing the bell off the fire truck at the National Armory in Vancouver. Uh, his, Retail history went back to uh, selling log truck tires for Montgomery Ward during the Great Depression. He sold, he, he delivered beer to Harry Truman at Spirit Lake Lodge. As a young man, he, during Prohibition, I shouldn't say young man, he was nine or ten at the time, during Prohibition, he supplied the Vancouver Police Department with hooch. <laughs> Sweet, Sweet knew everything. His father was a longshoreman, uh, and, and uh, anyway, Sweet knew everybody. So this one day, you know, customer comes in. Oh, where are you from? Anybody who had a Clark County connection, how long you been there? If it was longer than two or three generations, what's your name? I know you. So this. Lady said, "Oh, I'm from Amboy. Oh, what's your name? I know you." And she gave the name, and uh, so Swede's running down the, the family tree, and says, "Oh, so it was your uncle Billy who shot the sheriff?" And you know, this is the stain on that family. And Swede was always very quick. He said, "That S.O.B. I wanted to shoot the sheriff. They made me do it." <laughs> So the Swede could get away with that, and uh, he almost always did, and uh, that was kind of an influence. Uh, some, of the, some of the women who worked at the store uh, saw his influence on some of the younger men around the store and would admonish him for uh, being such a bad influence. <laughs> but anyway, he, he was a big part of our history as well. So I'm ready for questions. You started um, recently put in uh, hard liquor, uh, and and I know that your competitor also did too. And I know you fought it for a long time. Uh, what was what made up the, your mind to to finally do that? We we got tired of sending so many people out of town. <laughs> <laughs> I had a conversation with uh, Rich Schisler. Uh, oh year and a half ago, and uh, he said, well, Tom, you're going to put in hard liquor, and I said, well, Rich, 
I don't want it, but I have to do it as a competitive response if you were going to put in hard liquor. What are you going to do? And uh, he said, well, Tom, I'd probably have to do it as a competitive response, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> he already had his liquor license approved. Ours got finalized yesterday. <laughs> um, he already had his approved. I let him know that uh, we were moving forward on it, and so they beat us to the punch by 30 days, uh, which is fine with me. But uh, the tax structure gives a merchant a black eye. Uh, Washington's taxes on that are, are just, you know, they, they make the merchant look, look bad. So they're, when you start balancing the pros and the cons, there are very few good reasons to get into it, except that we don't want to send regular customers out of town. And that was our purpose. You could do one up on it and get your cannabis license. Oh. <laughs> I'll think on that. <laughs> Your dad bought the store in 69. Correct. You were a teenager then. 16. 16, okay. Was he also, and you mentioned Longview, I didn't know that, but was he in the grocery business there? No. My father had a career with Weyerhaeuser. Um, he attended the University of Washington School of Forestry. One of his uh, classmates was a guy named Dave Weyerhaeuser. And, uh, Anyway, my father started uh, his career with Weyerhaeuser um, out of Chehalis, uh, bucking logs by hand. And uh, he moved up the ranks, you know, of course, once he graduated, then uh, graduated the forestry school, then Weyerhaeuser put him to uh, work in an office setting, and uh, they sent him to Yale for his postgraduate. Uh, in math and physics, and he never completed that. Um, then he worked his way up, but his last stint for Weyerhaeuser um, in Longview, uh, he had been the superintendent of the plywood plant and the superintendent of both sawmills, and uh, he was climbing the corporate ladder a little bit faster than the guy on the rung ahead of him, you know, up above him, and uh, so. He got kicked off and uh, he decided he'd had enough of corporate life and was looking for something that uh, the whole family could participate in and uh, landed here. Mm -hmm. So how old was he, was he then? Uh, he was born 21, 21 and that was 69 so he would have been 47, yeah, his birthday is December, he was 47. Had zero retail experience, none whatsoever. So, uh, Tom, um, I had the pleasure of visiting, visiting with Jeff here, your younger brother, your brother, a couple of months back. And he told a very interesting story about your dad flying a plane during World War II. And he, he was a fighter pilot yeah. during World War II. And he had a pilot's license while he was in high school, and he was in the Civil Air Patrol. And so, of course, uh, U.S. Army Air Corps found him to be a natural. And uh, yes, he, he fought at World War II, um, mostly in uh, Italy and North Africa. Did he crash land one of them? More than one. <laughs> <laughs> more, more than one. Uh, in Italy, the air base was, uh, was in a volcano crater. And they'd load the planes so heavy and they had to climb so steeply coming out of this crater that a lot of them would stall on takeoff and just go tail first in the ground. Uh, most of them burned on impact, uh, but his didn't. That, that was uh, one of his, uh, his flying stories. And another one was uh, he was piloting a plane with his boss um, while working for Weyerhaeuser. And, uh, they spent the night in Klamath Falls, filled up the plane, ready to leave first thing in the morning, didn't check the fuel, somebody mm -hmm. siphoned fuel overnight. 
they took off and uh, he managed to land the plane in a field doing figure eights coming back down. So I don't know what altitude or how far away from the airfield they were when that happened. But, uh, that boss stayed in touch forever. <laughs> they, they remained very, very good friends even though they had gone separate ways. Well, was uh, getting into this business an easy decision for you? Did you just, uh, you were the son and you just uh, took over? Or did you have other yeah. thoughts? I, I would, yeah, mine was not quite by default. I'd gone away to college, spent four years in Seattle at Seattle University, which was in a very urban environment. And after four years of that, I realized I don't want anything more to do with the city. So I came back not really knowing what I wanted to do, but the store was growing at such a rate then. We were growing 20 to 25% per year, compounded year after year. So it, it was just simply overwhelming. So, I like to say that my three brothers had better sense than I did, and they were not other things. But, uh, anyway, uh, I got involved in it, decided to uh, stick around, and the store kept growing, and it became part of me. I just want to say, I think what impresses people like this is that they have the discipline to come down and check the store and then and they, they kind of knew everybody and it's just a was a, a good attitude that you had in there i think that people noticed that right away when they came in Thank i you. used to lose some guests in there once in a while <laughs> <laughs> yeah our, our public address system has been used more than once to uh, they asked uh, me once how long have you been here i said two weeks and she said oh you're an old timer <laughs> Whenever I go into the hardware department and you help me, you're always spot on and you know exactly what, yeah. what, what to do. Do you have any training in that? Um, my training is actually um, at the expense of my customers. They've had the problem. I don't want to repeat it. You know, people bring their problems to us, and, and I try to uh, reinforce this with the help. We're not in the merchandise business. We're in the problem-solving business. We need to be able to improvise something, even if we don't have the exact part. And uh, so part of it is challenge. You know, it, it can be fun to to uh, rise to one of these challenges to say, you know, what are we going to do? How, how are we going to solve this? But, uh, you know, that, that's how we kind of make it fun. Yes? Would it be presumptuous to ask about the next generation? <laughs> no. Uh, my daughter, Chrissy, and son-in-law, Anthony, are both active in the business. Uh, Christy serves as our general manager. Um, Anthony has um, just a wealth of experience in both mechanical and electronic areas. So they live at, over uh, in Colville and with 48 cameras networked computers and telephones, they can cover more ground on our premises than I can standing there. So uh, they run the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, my presence is less and less necessary. I no longer keep a schedule, uh, which is something I've been aiming for for a long time. No longer keep a schedule. I can choose my tasks and uh, pretty much come and go as I please. And what are your hobbies? My hobbies include hunting and fishing, and I have lots and lots of things to do around the place. <laughs> <laughs> my hobbies are what my wife says they are. 
Well, you talked about a lot of the good luck that you had mm -hmm. in the store that did. Could you mention something uh, bad, uh, some, something that you bought, or some situation that changed uh, dramatically that you hadn't anticipated? That... Um, I have a salesman sitting here, Bill McKee. Uh-oh. <laughs> Bill, Bill can undoubtedly uh, point to an awful lot of uh, merchandise choices that we've had over the years that uh, didn't work out so well. We experiment a lot, and we try to not get into anything so deep that we can't get back out. Uh, so that's how we got into a lot of the niche markets. Uh, but in, in terms of uh, you know tragedy befalling us, there, there hasn't been anything really catastrophic. Probably the closest thing to it was the first year we had the store, my father had back surgery and left my mother, you know, was a week in the hospital, left my mother alone with the store in Ocean Park and uh, had just one car and uh, the car broke down and uh, they didn't know that they were going to make it through that, that first winter here. But uh, the generosity of the people in the community changed all that. I understand that when, when we have some company that come and come out of town, they want to go see Jack. Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, I always tell them if Jacks don't have it, you don't need it. <laughs> well, we say if we don't have it, we don't sell it. <laughs> one of the uh, one of the best advertising campaigns that we've ever had was uh, something my brother put together. It, uh, it started out with an advertisement for uh, the visitor's guide, where we got to list off everything we had. And my father looked at what I put together and said. This is no better than a Barn and Bailey circus ad. <laughs> Says it got everything in, you know, this just isn't working. And my brother happened to be here from Iowa. And so he composed the one that some of you have seen. It says, public admission. Contrary to what people say, we do not have everything. And my brother John uh, is a fine arts major, and he had it done all of this in a style that was a duplication or a, a recreation of how it would have looked if it came out of wood-blocked letters. And uh, I can't tell you how many times printers have tried to corrupt all that by cleaning it up. <laughs> and, and we just didn't want it. But, uh, you know, that, that was uh, the denial turns out to be more powerful than the claim. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so uh, that, that was one of my father's, uh, uh, that, that was just a piece of his wisdom that, that played out, that, that demonstrated that uh, you don't try to build yourself up, you know, give people reasons to, uh, to wonder about this, you know, give them a head scratcher. <laughs> and, and, and so he did that. For what it's worth, I was at uh, the lumber yard one day, this was several years ago, looking for something, I don't remember. And uh, we looked and couldn't find it. So the person who was working at the lumber yard said, well, you know, if you go to Jack's and you go to the second aisle in the hardware, on the bottom shelf, see there's two boxes down there. The left box has <laughs> Diane, you had a question? Well, three things stand out in my mind going into Jack's. Number one is the delight of Autodex doors. But also, I am amazed at the classic beverages. To me, it's like, how in the world did you decide to go to these old fashioned? Beverages. And the other one was I needed something for my little smartphone so that I could 
videotape lecturers before the museum did. And you've got the little thing there from my smartphone, <laughs> right along with all the other screens and unusual things, which is just going to be great. All, all the modern convenience. It just blows me. But I know you agonized over the doors. Can you tell us why that was so difficult? Well, we needed to replace the doors. Uh, one of them would <coughs> fail, one of the other. It was broken and, and it broken the glass. And uh, we'd seen plenty of people struggle with the doors and it also received plenty of comments. Don't ever change anything, you know. Uh, we decided that uh, keeping the door style and adding automatic openers would probably be a good choice, and we did. And then I did it. So far it's worked out. <laughs> Except when I got caught by the electrical inspector, I didn't have my permit. <laughs> <laughs> I think your meat department is... I said something to my wife about how nice the stool looked this one particular morning. The floors were all shining the whole bit. I said to her, gee, I wonder who they have come in and do those floors. She says, oh, Tom probably does them. He does everything else around here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I know it was comical. I wish I could take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, could you say something about the catalog business? I, I mean, is that handled, it must be handled totally somewhere else by other people, sort of? Or are you, are you Our first catalog in 2000, I guess it was published fall of 2003. Our first catalog, we had it done by an outside party. And uh, time, my daughter and son-in-law have done 100% of it. They take the photos, they use the software. The uh, font that is used is one that was uh, designed by, by my brother John. Uh, it's called Brothers. And uh, anyway, they, they've been composing the catalog ever since. <coughs> and, uh, we fulfill uh, most of those orders uh, from the upstairs above our hardware department. Uh, at the height of the Christmas season, we're oftentimes uh, shipping uh, oh, 2,000 to 3,000 parcels a week. Wow. From one of our customers, one of our regular um, we had a wholesale site on the Aladdin lamp business and uh, met up with this woman from uh, rural Kansas and she said that she looked at the map. She said, I'm in the middle of nowhere. You're at the edge of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, uh, you know, the internet erased um, geographical considerations uh, except for shipping costs and now there are so many third-party fulfillment capabilities and uh, you know for example we ship a lot of items into Amazon's warehouse and they will fulfill the orders to customers we have, we have roughly 18,000 items on Amazon we have our own eBay store we have another at any given time, three to five thousand eBay listings. Um, so those are all just little, you know, little niches where uh, we've been able to expand our, our scope and our reach, sales. Is it just the one business name then? Jack's Country Store. Um, we also own the trademarks Store in a Cool Place, RazorClams.com. We have, we had planned to uh, build a convenience store by our West Fuel Island. We have uh, North Beach Market Incorporated. How far in the future do you think that would come about? The convenience store? Yeah. I was going to go, I had it, the plans and I was uh, going to go get a building permit in 2006. But we couldn't find enough help. And uh, that was another blind luck item. Can you imagine building a, a new store in 2006, mm -hmm. open in 2007, 2008, just in time for the financial meltdown? Mm -hmm. uh, so at the time, uh, we were having difficult uh, 
we're just having the inability to find people who are looking for work because everybody was employed. Everybody who wanted a job had one. And that's why we didn't pull the trailer yeah. in. But uh, we had all the architect's plans and we had everything ready to go to the uh, building inspector. And I was uh, getting ready to lock out the door one day and then I ran into some struggle with uh, keeping the place staffed. And I didn't make my trip to Long Beach and uh, glad I didn't. Yeah. Well, it looks like we've come to an ending, and I want to thank you, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> We have the septic system in place, we have water, we have power, we have the plans. All we have to do is finance it. <laughs> uh, so all, all of the groundwork is laid, uh, but uh, we're, we're waiting for the right time. Uh, one of the uh, critical concerns right now is that we're too close to the 50 full-time equivalency employee threshold yeah. Um, yeah. for uh, triggering a, a certain uh, employer mandate. Yeah. Yeah. And we can't afford that when our competitors are not faced with the same, uh, same trigger. Thank you. I'm putting in a uh, car wash. <laughs> I looked at it. Don't we'll look at anything. <laughs> it, it's, it would sure go well up here. I think. Yeah, I think it would too. Yeah. I, I haven't found one yet that uh, does not have serious maintenance issues. You almost have to have a full time factory mm -hmm. trained technician mm -hmm. to keep them in operation. And uh, in a remote location like this, anytime we have to call out, a specialist. It's a thousand dollars to get them here, then come and repair some parts. Uh, and I don't see that working on a car wash right now. Just wait for a rainy day and take your brush out there. <laughs> There's always the beach in George Hill to retrieve it. You have to leave it like the rest of the car. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to be the shiny one, do you? <laughs> Thank you all for your interest. Thank you. Thank you.